Welcome to the Bio Charisma Podcast. Here's your host, Christopher Gardner. Good day, Bio Charismites. We have Tree Jenny. Actually, her name is Jenny Smith today of Community Carbon Trees. Uh, she's a wonderful reforester from Louisiana. She was once a lawyer that traded in the law books and all that rigmarole to come down and save the world. That's always a good thing, right? Uh, we have this wide-ranging discussion today where we, d- we discuss everything from what is a invasive species, which us gringos could be considered to be that down here in Costa Rica, to biochar, to uh, what biological corridors are, to her upbringing in Louisiana. Uh, just, it's a, it's a wonderful discussion. It gives you a feel for what type of people we have down here making a positive impact. Uh, Tree Jenny, I, I'm, I'm just going to call her that, even though her name is Jenny Smith. Uh, she's been a great inspiration to our whole community here, and she's put over a million trees in the ground. So enjoy the podcast. Activity. And, um, yeah, I did a semester there, and yeah, it was awesome. But, yeah, I needed to do it. But. But your Louisiana roots were, you were a dyed-in-the-wool country girl. Total country girl. I mean, we would go to school listening to Waylon Jennings, you know, Uh Country Boy Will Survive, and me and my brother and his Chevrolet side strip. And we we were the country kids that drove. 45 minutes to get to the fancy private school because you know my mother believed in a really good education and that's where I learned Spanish all the kids chose French of course it's Louisiana and I was like I'm gonna be the quirky weird one so there's like you know 85 people in my class Mm -hmm. and 69 of them chose French and the other of us did Spanish and I took Spanish from 5th to 12th grade so when I left high school I was fluent. That's wonderful. And that's why when I came here, it was like, from day one, I could conjugate. That's why I can write in Spanish. I can speak to a United Nations group. I can speak to a university group and be perfect Mm -hmm. with my Southern accent. It's why I don't really change and try to sound perfect. I've had to learn to dictate in a good Spanish accent so Siri can understand me. Mm -hmm. But when I get in front of a group of people and speak Spanish, I let it come out. Tango, una historia para ustedes. I go there because it grabs their attention. Definitely. They listen. They're like, damn, she sounds funny. Right. But she's speaking perfect Spanish. That's wonderful. So that came from Louisiana, too, because they believe in immersion. You know, everybody's speaking French. Mm -hmm. So why in the hell did I choose Spanish? I mean, I didn't know then that I would move to a foreign country, but... At but some I, level, you probably I, I did. I yeah. kind of knew I didn't fit in. Mm-hmm. I mean, I sure tried for seven and a half years being a lawyer. So how did you not fit in? Like, you're a country girl going to a private school. And by the way, I want to introduce Jenny Smith to oh. the Bio Charisma <laughs> podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so how did you not fit in? I, I was a country girl with lace eyelet panties on. <laughs> Seriously. Like, I had these little white underwear, and I wanted, like, my name embroidered or or flowers on them. So, like, I had on rubber boots and frilly clothes. Mm-hmm. I was a very girly girl. I did ballet. But I also lived way out in the country. So, at this private school, you know, all the kids were super fancy and rich and debutantes and and there me and my brothers were driving 45 minutes from a big farm out in the middle of nowhere Mm -hmm. and you know Friday night would roll around and I would have a date but they had to come pick me up and it was like wow it really filtered out who wanted to go out with me and who didn't because my daddy was like you gotta be home at midnight honey they can spend the night Mm -hmm. like in the guest house but Right. And that meant we had to leave at 10. What a great filter, though. It was a good filter. Wow. And, you know, growing up in the bayous and playing with my brothers and catching fish and climbing trees and 
getting so dirty. How, how big was the farm? Oh, how many that's brothers? Embarrassing. How many? How many brothers did you have? I had three brothers. Uh-huh. One since passed away in a car wreck when he was uh, was a stepbrother, Robbie, when he was thirty four. So that was a while now. Mm-hmm. Um, so two brothers, one older and one younger. Mm-hmm. Um, and a stepsister, so there were five of us. Wow. And we were a little pack. Plus, you know, in Louisiana, all the cousins. So the weekend would arrive, and all my fancy friends were doing their thing, and I couldn't really do it because we lived so far, and we would go to Pierre Park and go to the bayou and go to our fishing camp, and mm-hmm. I'd do that all weekend. I'd get back on Monday, and you'd hear all the kids talking about, you know, cotillion on Sunday, and there I was somewhere out in the boat mm-hmm. catching brim. Wonderful. It was wonderful. Now, were the brim in Louisiana big enough to eat? Yeah. We would catch the brim in Florida to go ahead and use to catch bass. So. Oh, yeah. You eat them down there. Oh, wow. Sacale, the little tiny ones. And, you know, they'll fry them up. They'll kind of take out the trepas, the the, the intestines and stuff. And then fry it up. You even eat the little tail. It's real tender. And, you know, I became a vegetarian, really, from all the crazy hunting and fishing we did. Because I saw, you know, many a deer take right. its last breath and then, then string it up and skin it. Mm-hmm. My brother could do it with a buck knife, take off the whole skin without one tear. Wow. Expert. Beautiful, beautiful. But, you know, it was really intense for me. I was a very... You could feel the energy. I could just feel it. And I just... I felt good that the deer was running around three and that it was actually, you know a test of metal between the hunter and the deer. I mean, you had to sit there in the tree for hours and scope it out. But um, it was intense for me. So, yeah, Yeah. like 16 years old, I announced to everybody, I'm a vegetarian. So, again, not fitting in. There's my family looking at me like, Jenny, what, what, what? Well, here's the thing. This is a really cool thing I've seen with a ton of my clients is, mainly women that actually come from families where they ate extremely well. And well, what I mean is that you had substantive, real food mm-hmm. during your, your, your prime years. Mm-hmm. And that sets you up for success your entire life. Wow. Because whatever you're fed the first seven years of your life in the formative years, it contextually sets the, sets the story arc for your entire life physiological existence cool so it, your story is actually a common story women like you you were getting fresh game meat yeah all the time you lived on the farm your body was nourished i was so we that, didn't eat junk food so that gave your that gave your consciousness the freedom to choose to be vegetarian that is so cool yeah And not fitting in with a family, you know, it was weird. I was so thankful that they didn't force me to eat things I didn't want. Well, they must really love you. They did. I was always, you know, my dad calls me Xenifer. (laughs) Xenifer and my big brother too. And so I think they always knew that I was a little rainbow and a little weird. And um, they let me be who I was, even though... You know, I was different than everyone around me and my family. And also, I mean, I was the first person who went to a a beyond college Mm -hmm. degree. I mean, my daddy still today, you know, anytime we go, he, is my daughter the lawyer, you know? And I'm like, Dad, I'm an agroforester. Don't call me a lawyer. You know, people automatically start judging. and, And yet... You know, I can see his pride. You know, he was a country boy. His dad was a volunteer fireman and a poet with a big, long beard who chewed tobacco and was always spitting tobacco. His name was Walker B. Smith. Awesome. I mean, what a name. I love it. And, you know, so I came from very salt of the earth and, and yet went to school with the fancy kids. Right. Right. We have a lot of parallels in our life because I grew up in one of the only horse communities in South Florida, but I went to essentially a Jewish prep school. And so I was one of the only goy, you know, one of the only non-Jewish people at that school, but it was my parents really believed in 
high level education. Yes. And it, I totally didn't fit in. I was like the rough and tumble toe head. <laughs> yeah. you know? I was just like really bored to yeah. death in class. And there were certain things I enjoyed, but overall I was not that like intellectually stimulated in school, but you got me an art or PE or recess or those things. And I was just like this bowling ball. And uh, I, I was definitely outside. I was an outsider. Yeah. So that's kind of neat. And living, then I'd go home and have to deal with all the animals and all the things. And that was something completely alien yeah. to my schoolmates. Yeah. I loved school. I was definitely a, a nerdy school kid. Mm -hmm. I made good grades. I loved it. I loved the arts as well. And and I was on the inside and the outside because I was a cheerleader. I was on homecoming court. You know, those little popularity contest kind of things. Um, and yet, you know, as time went, I always questioned, you know, wow, I'm spending my time on a bunch of fluff stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I'm ready. When it was time to graduate, I was ready. I was flying. Yeah. You know, I think nowadays kids are, they're so protected. Our parents let us fly the coop, you yeah. know? Well, my, I mean, I was told flat out, like my dad came to me when I was 15, and I really thank him for this. He said, I'm not going to pay for your college. Yeah. So if you want to go to college, you either have to get a scholarship or you have to go into the military and do the GI Bill. And I was very certain I wasn't going to do the military thing. Yeah. And that lit a fire under my ass. Yeah, it does. Like, yeah, yeah. And so you brought up this notion of essentially people that are coddled a little bit too much. Let that be our segue into the Costa Rica experience. Oh, boy. <laughs> and having to deal with your company, Community Carbon Trees, and volunteers, and just like the resourcefulness that you, and it, that was bred into you from your surroundings as being this, you know, wonderfully elegant, feminine, badass farm girl, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> Thank you. And then you come to Costa Rica. Give us a timeline and how you were able to take the, the resources from your from your younger years till now. I really can say that I have lived that that cliche out there, you know, it's all about the journey and, and my journey arriving to Costa Rica was was really special. It was almost like the purpose found me. Right. Because when I went to law school I was totally like, I am gonna be an environmental lawyer, I'm defending nature. So I started doing that, and I worked for a firm that represented Lloyds of London. So we were doing a lot of defense work, and of course, Louisiana is all about the oil. Mm -hmm. And uh, I worked under the Clean Water Act doing point source water pollution settlements, but working on the side of the company, because mm -hmm. I couldn't get a job then as the white-headed environmental person. So my justification was, okay, you're going to work on the inside and make sure these companies are regula regulated and when there is a spill you're dealing with the whole conciliation process. So that was somewhat true. But then I worked on a case for one of the very first environmental racism lawsuits that was filed by the Sierra Club back in the early 90s and environmental racism because this polyethylene plastic plant, mm -hmm. BASF dot. There's an area in Louisiana called Cancer Alley. Mm -hmm. All the plants go there. It's primarily African American. In Louisiana, we say black, and yeah. it's not politically incorrect. Right. Um, said they were going to make a bunch of jobs, just like developers say here with right. their developments. I'm making a bunch of jobs, mm -hmm. but they were a real low-level janitorial type jobs. So the lawsuit happened, and at the lower court, uh, we won which is to say no environmental racism went on. But I knew from the depositions and the discovery due diligence, mm -hmm. there was right. environmental racism going on. Mm -hmm. So I was conflicted 
on a conscience level mm -hmm. for the first time really after about seven years of practice. And then you're a baby lawyer, you know, you're working with a big team. I wasn't lead lawyer, anything like that, too young. So my firm saw that I was having a problem. Right. And so they're like, Jenny, we're going to send you on a vacation. Where do you want to go? I was like, oh, I've always wanted to go to Costa Rica. Yeah. Well, I mean, literally, little did they know, that was all she wrote. Mm -hmm. Came down here, 10-day vacation, with the vice president of Ocean Energy, mm -hmm. one of my so-called bosses, and uh, met Jack Ewing at oh, Hacienda Maru. Uh -huh. We were on a tour. A guy hit his leg on the zip line, busted it open. Nobody spoke Spanish. Mm -hmm. There's Jenny. I, I can communicate. So I'm helping the guy communicate. I'm calming him down. I'm telling the Tico guy, look, I'll walk out with the guy. And he's like, you can't do that. You're a tourist. I'm like, believe me, I can do it. Come on. I'm going to take this guy down. We go to the office. We get him all doctored up. He invites us over to the restaurant. Somebody pulls out the bottle of tequila. We start doing a few shots, it's, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon and I'm on vacation. I'm like, sure, why not? Three hours later, I'm laughing and carrying on, speaking my southern Spanish with all the Ticos there, and we're hooting and hollering, and Jack walks in, he's like, what the hell is going on in there? And like, oh, meet Jenny, and blah, 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 blah. Next thing I know, Jack is like, wow, you know, do you want a job? Mm -hmm. It's like, a job? <laughs> and he says, you know, we're about to start working with the Nature Conservancy to name the biological corridor which is hence now Paso de la Danta or Path of the Taper. And I'm looking at him with these, you know, young starry eyes going, whoa, like, what would that look like? And he says, well, you would move in, in the big Casona house. I'd pay you $400 a month. Mm -hmm. You'd get to eat for free. And I'm like, huh. Much better than the, the, it, mo the moral... You the know, moral blood, dilemma. The blood money. And the $4,000 salary. I mean, I mean, yeah. it was never about money for me. And so I freaking knew instantly. I said, yes. Mm -hmm. I said, I know this. I need to go back and exit slowly. I have a, obligations. You know, from an ethics standpoint, I needed to, to remove myself from my cases, not leave anybody in a lurch. Right. Just it was important to do it in the right way. And flew back to Louisiana, waltzed into the office with my tan on Monday morning and announced, I'm moving to Costa Rica. Of course, you know. And how long ago was that? That was in 1998. Hallelujah. Yeah. You're coming up on your 20-year anniversary. I am. Wow. I am. So it was beautiful. I came down with two boxes and a dog. A little blue healer. I don't know if you ever met Chica when no. she was alive. She was brilliant. She planted probably about 400,000 trees wow. with me. So much protection she gave me, and, and she was my companion. I came a single woman. Did she save you from any snakes? Yes. Out in the field? So many. And the boys, too. You know, the boys love having her in there with them because she would, her tail would go up and she would freeze. Mm -hmm. So she was so smart that she knew not to bark. Right because we didn't want the snake to escape us and we would take these long bamboo sticks and sort of stick it around the snake to kind of cage it in uh -huh. and then one of the boys would chop the head off. And I mean, I don't like to kill animals, but if you're in the bush with that a tercio is. palo and sometimes three or four of them, you, you want to kill them. That's the cutest way I've ever heard somebody say tercio, <laughs> tercio, palo. tercio palo. <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> I kind of hoped that I could make some boots out of their skin because I felt so bad about killing them. Have, do you know anybody that can do that? I was told no, that they're so poisonous that you do not touch that skin, that it's just not happening. I have a picture one day of Luis, our crew chief, with his snake boots on. Yeah. My daddy bought everybody a pair of snake boots one year yeah. when we were having really big projects. When we were doing that big project out on Cacao Ridge, we planted like... 24,000 trees in one season so wow. we brought a bunch of snake boots back and that year one day they killed like nine snakes in one day and we took a photo and that was the day I wanted my boots and Louise said absolutely no Jenny no no every which way no 
So, wow, we were, when we were planting Fuente Verde, we had one day where we killed four tercia pellets, and we actually ate some of the tercia pellets. Really? And they it told was, me you don't eat it too. Well, it was in the, the, the Tico gentleman that was living there, he was willing to eat anything, try anything. Wow. And there probably was some poison in it because I did have somewhat of a uh, tripping experience. Did you? But it was wonderful. Yeah. It was a, when I say wonderful, the experience of like the vision quest that I went yeah. on with it was like you could feel the vibrance oh, yeah. of the energy there. And just to bring you back to Louisiana, I mean, Louisiana is like the home, like how many different viper... We swam with water moccasins on a they, daily basis. They, you yeah. just were like, oh, be careful. The water moccasin nest is there. I mean, zero fear, which serves me well because right. sometimes I get people who come who, who are, don't have a connection with nature. And I think that's one of the funnest things I get to do is to help them open and and commune with nature, open their eyes and all of their senses and get that childlike wonder. Right. And I've had people, you know, start crying out in the forest, like take them with us, seed collecting, and they're, they're crying from fear or joy. Usually it starts as fear and then it turns into joy. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a blessing not to be afraid. Of it, it and I think that's part of my role here is to be that that catalyst to get people out there. I feel so comfortable, mm -hmm. and well, you, you know. really bridge so many worlds. You're you're an educated woman that's also in touch with nature, speaks the language perfectly. Like so, you have so many ways in which you can, you know, have the Venn diagram of society kind of come together, and then you you can kind of be like, look at this vista, look at this vista. It's I a try. It's a very beautiful thing. Thank you. So you're you're working with Jack Ewing. You, you start to plant some trees. You know, the tree planting didn't start out right away. I still didn't know I was gonna. Uh huh start a reforestation company, came down, started working with the Nature Conservancy with him in the corridor, and through moving around in the communities, going to the different communities to be part of the educational process about what is a biological corridor. And your your listeners may not know what that is. Please so, define. yeah, it's a uninterrupted stretch of rainforest mm -hmm. or any forest, mm -hmm. usually at least a square mile radius of 50 miles mm -hmm. because that is what our larger animals need to survive. Okay. So a tapir, a jaguar, mm -hmm. those animals need these uninterrupted stretches. They don't want to see people. Mm -hmm. They won't go towards the edges. And the fragmentations of the rainforest is one of the hugest problems we have for the loss of species of plants and animals. Right. So we're losing medicines insects, frogs, plants, trees, mm -hmm. you name it. And the movement back then mm -hmm. in the conservation world was to educate about biological corridors. And all this money went to people to map it. Mm -hmm. And I'm an action person. Right. And it bothered me right. that there was all this money flying about for a bunch of people to go count frogs. And I'm like, well, shit, let's get to work. Like... Mm -hmm. Look at all these deforested lands and look at all these people with nothing to do. And do you, what was the, the history of this particular area and how it got deforested? Yeah, I know that history because uh, during my time that I went back to Louisiana to exit gently from my job, I did some research and literally got, I had lawyer entrance into the Library of Congress, right. Nexus, Lexis, all those amazing research tools. Before the internet was really big, right. they were like the beginning sources of doing that type of research. And um, this area here where we are, San Juan de Dios, District of Baru and Aguirre, southern zone of Costa Rica, was deforested between 1974 and 1977. It was all paid for by multinational cheap meat companies. Right. Wendy's was a big one. Burger King was a big one. Not McDonald's. And the farmers 
I found out after through interviewing them, mm -hmm. got paid to burn it down. Mm -hmm. It was too steep right. to take the lumber out. So again, we released toneladas of, mm -hmm. of carbon dioxide right. of lumbers that could have been used at least to build things and right. store the carbon forever, but it got burned. Mm -hmm. And because the topsoils are so thin, mm -hmm. in six or seven years, all the topsoil ran off, whether it be the torrential rain or the right. other side of the coin, which is the burning equatorial sun. So they had to continue to slash and burn mm -hmm. after the original subsidized burning. Ugh. And, you know, and then they got forgotten, as imperialism always does. You know, let's go rape it. Let's get all the raw resources. Let's get the free labor. Right. And then let's move on. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened to this zone. And a lot of the people that work with our group, they remember their grandparents burning it down. Some of the 40- mm -hmm. and 50-year-olds remember it. And then I think for me, that's one of the... The most rewarding things for me personally is to now see the community showing their children through action replanting. Mm -hmm. So these kids growing up and like with our kids nature day activities and such, mm -hmm. their memory is going to be about mom and dad, mom and dad getting paid to replant, not mom and dad getting paid to burn it down. That's wonderful. That's so, like a complete karmic reversal it is in, in in my neighborhood in san salvador i know a couple of the guys that i've worked with and they talked about how their father literally put an axe in their hand and yeah. he's like chop it down and burn it yeah i'm like could you imagine oh it's could painful you absolutely imagine the the there's just certain corridors that I've been through, like on the San Luis Pass and the backside of Border Cayon and like being back there and just like the the absolute grandeur and how majestic that is. It's something to, to absolutely behold. It is. It's it's sacred. It is. And you know, with the the creation of community carbon trees, it was one of the, the obstacles I sought to resolve was why don't the people replant these fragmented sections? Mm -hmm. And why do the people deforest what's left? And they're both related to the same aspect of the solution is money. Right. So they don't replant because they don't have the resources. It's a lot of hard work. They don't have a truck to go get the trees. There's no nursery in the community. There's nobody paying them for their hours. Mm -hmm. And then why do they cut it down? Well, they need money. So if there's a Cristobal mm -hmm. out there, the one and only one left, and mama needs a new stove, and baby needs to go to the doctor, well, yeah, daddy's going to go cut it down. And it's really arrogant and lack of empathy a screen goes shaking our fingers and going don't cut it down you know i really by being out in these communities and sitting and talking with them over lunch my heart ached for the lack of opportunity and the lack of alternatives and right. that's why i'm such a champion of of paying tree planters and it, it bothers me, and I've had to like smooth all those triggers down, like with my practices, my Qigong practice, I just smooth those ruffled feathers down, and it bothers me, you know, the volunteer labor that's expected from tree planters, and the $5 trees flying around out in the world, and here, buy my hat, and we're going to plant 10 trees, and here, you know, I'm going to put a tree on my logo, but I'm never going to give back to the trees. I'm expecting to give away a thousand dollars worth of trees and ask all these people to plant it for free. Mm -mm. I mean, it takes real work. Yeah. And then four years of maintenance after the right. fact to make sure that what we plant actually grows. Yes. So, I mean, really the work begins with planting the tree. Mm -hmm. And I'm just a fiend 
for defending these alternative income streams for these communities because it works. The impact is real. Right. When you pay someone to, to do the work, then they develop this new relationship with the tree. And like we're talking about, their kids see it. They see mama and daddy being honored for working with the machete. Right. For planting this tree. They will be loathe to cut that tree down in the future because they love it. They yeah. got paid. We're all accountable people. You know, you right. do you do good work when you're getting paid. Mm -hmm. Some of us do good work when we're not getting paid. Mm -hmm. But in general, you know, that esteem is just as important as the tree is itself. And it's really been the cornerstone of, of our model. In our, in our conversation before we started recording, the word symbiosis, mm -hmm. and in that vein, the word reciprocal, reciprocity, where there is always an exchange, even if it's a delayed exchange. Yeah. It has to be that way. If not, there's going to be carnage, as, as you saw coming down here. Like, I've seen photos of this place in the early 80s, and it had, like, half the, the coverage that it does now. Yeah, we're making progress. Like, there is tremendous amount, and it makes me so happy to see yeah. pictures of, like, La Florida is actually a forest now. It's not... Yeah. It's not this barren wasteland yeah. for, for cows. And, but to, to actually give these wonderful Tico people their due and should say, your labor is actually worth something. Yeah. That, that makes, that just warms my heart. And I think that's why we're so lucky is because, not lucky in the sense that like, oh, it had nothing to do with it. But like, there's a symbiotic, reciprocal nature that I see that occurs between uh, people like you with community carbon trees, Vita Authentica, living space where there's, there's this continual being part of the community. Yeah, you guys do that too with the living space yeah. and the including the Costa Ricans in yes. on part of the profits. And I, and I love those models and these really are the, you know, everyone loves to use hashtag be the change and new paradigm, you know, it's all a bunch of fancy words, you know, and show me the action. It's like Tom Cruise and whatever that movie was, show me the money. Yeah. I really, um, you know, I'd love to move to, this is your fire sign coming out. Oh gosh, it's there. <laughs> it is so there. You know, I love this idea of bartering and trading, and I have real good philosophical conversations sometimes with foreigners, especially the new ones who've only been here for a year or two years, and they they, they come with these beautiful, high-minded concepts and ideals, and, and and I agree. But like I say, you know, we got to build a bridge there. We can't just take poor people truly impoverished people and ask them to trade pineapples for their tree planting work like not fair mm. step back a second step back a second and i do believe that i'm sometimes the mouthpiece for for some of these controversial concepts of, of fair pay you know i know that's part of the so-called permaculture and we were laughing the other day and making fun and having humor about the permaculture shit show I mean, really, like, there's just so much posing out there, and it, it's not really real. So this fair share stuff and recognizing that, that that is part of the new paradigm, that there be a horizontal diffusion of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. There's some big words, but really it just means, you know, everybody kind of gets to be in charge of themselves and not be beholden to the big man of the big company. Right. and keep their land and reforest their land and and keep the the produce and the resources right. and you know i think that that is a great solution for especially what's going on in the developing world right this is like a, the whole way to negotiate to have a, to really be able to negotiate well there has to be a win-win yeah like if we're going to be ethical Let's say. Yeah, and and the things that you're doing are very ethical. So it's about balancing out this imbalance for cheap burger meat or whatever. Yeah, 
So, okay. Or greenwashing, whatever it may be, by giving away a few trees. Right. So here it's about ethic, ethics. It's about negotiating. And in negotiating, you have to find out what the, what the people that you're negotiating with actually value. Yes. So here's a neat little antidote. In my neighborhood, I was, you know, I always had these, like, innovative ideas. Yeah. None of them were hitting home with any of my Tico friends. So one day I was just cooking on my on my very first rocket stove, uh -huh. and it was smokeless. And they saw me preparing some food, and a couple of my guys came over, and they're like, what is this? And immediately I could see this was of value to them. Yeah. Because now their wives or their mothers didn't have to breathe smoke. Yeah. And it took very little firewood. So in their mind, it was less work. Yeah. And I was like, this is an appropriate technology. Mm -hmm. I'm not bringing anything new to them. They've always used wood and they've always used fire. Mm -hmm. I'm just showing them a different way Perfect. in which they could do it that takes a lot of work off their plate and where they're, they don't asphyxiate the loved ones in their family. <laughs> and it, that's when it dawned on me. Like the whole thing you just said is like, oh, okay, this is it. This is appropriate technology. This is something that's so, the, that will be socially accepted. Yeah. And like within, like within a couple months, there's a dozen of them yeah. in, in, in my neighbor's homes. And kudos to you for the perseverance and keep trying. Yeah. You know, because it, it does require that resiliency and that determination to keep trying and right. not get discouraged. Oh, it's it's amazing. The uh but the this one of the things I always love about this area. Unlike you, I grew up in urban in an urban area and moved to an area that was somewhat rural mm -hmm. but it was still i mean it's south florida there's not yeah. like miami definitely, was a hop skipping away yeah, yeah it's yeah. definitely not the bayou the the can-do attitude that i see that the ticos have here oh, don't you love it it's just get her done yeah get her done like let's figure Tico it out style i love it it's always away i love it and it's usually very inexpensive and it's usually using Recycled junk around. Yeah. I just love it. Nothing gets thrown away. It's all It's so inspiring. It is inspiring. It is inspiring. So okay Go back into the transition. You're a lawyer. You make mm -hmm. your slow exit. You get down here You're working to build this corridor. T tell us about the corridor and, and what happened from that point You know that was also a huge education. Wow, I've had like three lifetimes in Costa Rica over these 20 years. So I started with working with Hacienda Baru and Asana, the conservation group, and the Nature Conservancy. Learned a lot about big conservation groups and what I don't like about them. Um, it's a whole other topic, but um, it gave me this opportunity, which I'm forever grateful for, to get out into the communities. And so by getting out into the communities and seeing these obstacles and all this deforestation and the broken corridor, I was like, wow, why isn't anybody doing anything about this? And, you know, nobody was. It was little old me. So I was like, well, shit, here we go again. I can plant a tree. My daddy grew trees. Mm -hmm. we, I got my first car from cutting down eight trees. Nothing wrong with cutting down some trees as long as you're replanting. And so I uh, just decided, okay, I'm going to start a reforestation company. You right. know, and again, I was told I was crazy mm -hmm. by the people you know. Mm -hmm. And I laugh and go, I'm, I'm still here. Yeah. Um, started a reforestation company. Our very first clients, two guys from uh, South Florida. Oh, great. Back in El Silencio, they wanted to plant... 18,000 trees. They bought a huge piece of property and wanted to bring back the wildlife. Met me through Asana and I said, I can, I can do this. Mm -hmm. Started looking for the trees and could not find any biodiversity. Wow. All the Tico agroforesters wanted to give me a marion, which is just a lumber tree, some pachote, again, monoculture, mm -hmm. all one kind of tree. Wood, 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 lumber, lumber, lumber. And uh, 
it was distressing because mm -hmm. I had learned as a kid, you know, how important the biodiversity is to attract the animals, to get them places to build thickets. Mm -hmm. The secondary regeneration is important. Um, just didn't like the fact that I couldn't, couldn't buy what I needed. So again, you see a hole and, and you fill it. Right. So I started collecting seeds and trying to get them to sprout and fill in bags and getting my friends involved, you know, Tom Sawyer style. Mm -hmm. This is fun. You want to help? And started producing the trees and made my clients wait a whole year so that the next year we would have a little more diversity. And from there, it just mounted, you know, project by project. Again, as I said, starting, you know, I really have walked this path. I really didn't know where it was going. I didn't set out to do a reforestation company. I just kept filling needs, and the people kept coming to me. Mm -hmm. And so I just kept sort of kind of flexing my that bravery muscle going, yeah, I can do this, mm -hmm. and pulling together teams, you know. I can't do it by myself. Mm -hmm out obviously and there it was you know lots of on-the-job training lots of walking with old timers learning the trees and when they gave their seeds and walking and walking and you know it's like treasure hunting it's so much fun you know I set out in the morning and come back with bags of loot You're right. and then seeds and you know kind of was the impetus for the the tree nurseries and now every year we're producing anywhere from 25,000 trees right around there if I have a big big project um, sometimes I'll split it in two generally I will so that I can have super biodiversity for the two years we produce about hundred and ten species Wow! yeah um, it's so easy now because the trees we've planted now are right. giving us back. So you really do reap what you sow. Right. And, um, you know, we have probably eight things on the threatened list. Well, from, let me, let me interject. From a natural biological level, you reap what you sow. Yeah. Unlike some of the agrochemical companies out yeah. there where you don't, you don't reap anything. Well, we're reaping the negative, and in that yeah. way, it's true, too. We're reaping killing of the bees. Yeah. Or to quote my good friend Miriam Hanane's film, The Vanishing of the Bees, which absolutely is related to the neonicotinoid herbicides and pesticides, yes. you know? So we reap what we sow as humans, yes. whether it's in the positive or the negative. That's a good way of putting it. And it is. So yeah. those agriculture companies are reaping gluten intolerance from the glycosophates, or however you say that. Glyphosate. Gly gly glyphosate. Glyphosate. Yes. I love to say things wrong, you yeah, know, whatever. You know what I mean. Definitely. That Monsanto stuff. Yeah. Um, we reap, you know, the death of the small American farmer from yeah. big agriculture. So again, that diffusion of horizontal sovereignty, if we could get back to the model, Wendell Berry talks about it, where we're with the, the food in the hands of the small farmers and eating local and acting local. You know, when I was growing up, the big bumper sticker was, think globally, act locally. Right. Well, to me, the new bumper sticker is, act globally, act locally because now if we don't fix the equator all of us on the planet right. we've got a real climate crisis on our hands mm -hmm. I'm not gonna sit here and say that I know what's going on mm -hmm. with the weather my brother is a paleontologist I grew up arguing about climate change right. so doesn't matter to me whether you think it's happening or not. I do agree that the earth is going to take care of herself. It's going to be what it's going to be. However, nobody's ever going to convince me that planting trees on the equator isn't a fabulous solution for rebalancing some of our broken life cycles, Precisely. such as the hydrological cycle. Absolutely. You know, recovering the equator and having these trees recycle more water vapor. Mm -hmm 
create more cooling clouds, sending that healthy, big, thick, cumulus cloud cover around our planet, it's absolutely a good thing. Mm -hmm. So we got to act globally. Just because people live in California, they say to me, oh, well, I'm planting trees in my backyard. And I'm like, yay, awesome. What about the equator? Mm -hmm. Can't you plant one here too? Don't you get on an airplane and fly around? Mm -hmm. Like our trees are going to sequester way more carbon dioxide than the tree up in California. Right. Our tree is going to is going to recycle way more water vapor mm -hmm. than the tree in California. In fact, our tree is going to send the cloud up to California to make it rain in a balanced way instead of this alternating drought deluge drought mm -hmm. deluge and do the research i mean that is what's happening with the hydrological cycle Absolutely. and the only thing really that recycles the water are the trees so have you ever come across uh this might be getting a little bit out there but it's something i came across because i'm inventing water purification systems and so i've done a ton of research into what constitutes wonderful water, where our wonderful water comes from. And anybody that goes into that research, you come to find out how our hydrological cycle has been hijacked. Yeah. And there's tons of patents that came out post-World War II that were about weaponizing the hydrological cycle to actually create what they call uh, rapid succession of seasonal something-something. And it's all about, it's the oldest game in the book. How did the kings and the queens manage their serfdom? They starved them to death. Yeah, well, look at the Batman movies. Who was that evil dude that got the weather machine? Dr. Cold or Dr. Freeze? Or Dr. Freeze. Or, yeah, yeah, you know, I remember that as a kid going, oh, my gosh, can they control the weather? And yeah. they sure are trying. They're trying. So, Geo chemtrails, yeah, uh, you name it, the heart. I mean, we're getting way out there, and I love to go way out there. Oh, good, so good. Proceed. I'm glad because this is something that I had a real hard time with when I go into Western industrialized countries where people have a disconnection from nature. And I do not say that as a character assassination. No, it's not I'm just judgment. It's an objective thing where. When you're in an environment that is actually physically harmful to you, your senses will start to shut down. You will go into cognitive dissonance. Yeah. It's like people in abusive relationships won't see half of the abusive tendencies just because that's the way they survive. Yes. And I've literally been with people pointing at a grid of, I don't like to use the term chemtrail anymore. It's actually high atmosphere uh, aerosol dispersant. That's its actual technical okay. name. And pointing to a grid and saying, that's not coming from an airport. That's not normal flight patterns. We're on the eastern seaboard where all the planes either come from over the Everglades or over the ocean. Why is that grid right there and watch it and watch it for hours and hours. and people just go into this cognitive malaise of being like yeah they can't or they won't i i think it's more of a can't because that starts this tumbleweed effect of like wait a minute houston we have a problem I, literally <laughs> so it's like wait a minute they're controlling the weather or they're attempting to control the weather? Why? It goes down this whole thing. And so for me, I see it as an opportunity where like-minded people can actually come up with solutions. Yeah. Because in all honesty, throughout history, we've always been hunted. Mm -hmm. As the, the apex predator, guess what? There's a karma in being an apex predator. Yeah. You have yeah. other apex predators. Yeah that are, you know, doing their thing. Do you believe in aliens? <laughs> I believe in interdimensional. Yeah. So I'm a big, I'm a big person when it comes to definitions. Mm -hmm. I have seen interdimensional beings. Mm -hmm. 
my worldview is not one that is shared by most people. Mm-hmm. So I like to get specific. Uh-huh. There, there are things in the sky that I know are mm-hmm. not man-made, per se. I also have the benefit of being in touch and with people that have been in like military black budget scenarios. Ooh. Yeah, this and place attracts a lot of really cool, yeah. interesting. I've been around. Misfit. <laughs> I've been around people that like worked in DARPA, worked for uh, Lockheed Martin Skunk uh-huh. Works, worked for JPL Jet Proportion Laboratories. And what they've shared with me, and what I've seen in the sky, my own personal experiences working on devices that de- dealt with the physics of scalar interferometry. There's this whole other thing that is occurring that the common person, the common uh, wage slave, mm-hmm. the, com- the, the person that is in the cycle of materialism, yeah. And once again, I don't say that as a character assassination. Right. That's just, you know, for whatever reason, that's, that's the, their life path that they're going through. Right. That they're just, they're completely unaware of. Yeah. And what I'm so excited about is in this time is that there it seems to be a uh, growth in sensitivity. Yeah. Like post-World War II, United States was this massive, ha-ha. We did it. Yeah. We We're the most powerful. We rule. And there's a wonderful thing to that aspect, but it also created an insensitivity yeah. to the And less. a sense of uh, what infallibility, invincibility. Invincibility, that's a great word. And so now, you know, when I first moved to Costa Rica, I'm only a 10 year person, I'm not a 20 year person. Oh. <laughs> but. Uh, my my partner and I at the time we went back to to Florida after like a year of being here and like we got we went to our favorite little restaurant and she's a total granola type and yeah. I remember she ordered this blueberry muffin and the woman goes and and microwaves it <gasps> and she, and I remember my partner look, looking at me with these big sad eyes and she goes she nuked my muffin. And it was like this whole, like, oh my goodness. Our parents grew up post-World War II. They were the baby boomers. Nothing, the big, the big man won. Yeah. We're like the second and third proxy generations that are like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. Sensitivity, sensitivity. We actually got... Because we have a, 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 we are infected with this strain of affluenza. Yeah. Like we got to benefit from yeah. the affluence of that, to the point where we could be sensitive enough to yeah. actually be like, oh wait a minute, this this is way out of balance. This is totally out of balance. So. And that is where the um, the ability in many ways to give back comes from is those of us who did grow up affluent yeah. and we're told you come from the most powerful place mm-hmm. and that always weighed on me as a kid. Like I used to sit and like think about it and wonder what it was like to live with nothing. In fact, when I came to Costa Rica, I wanted to. I right. wanted to suffer and get that feeling so I could identify with it more and having my partner used to be my my partner was from Argentina mm-hmm. and he didn't have any of those affluent sensibilities it was absolutely opposite right. oppressed and there's never enough and so he would always marvel at me like well god yeah i guess you can go out there and be a do gooder because you never had to worry about anything and i would retort mm-hmm. Well, yeah, it's my responsibility. It, it, I have to do this mm-hmm. because if I don't, who is? Right. And of course you get a lot of fabulous do-gooders out there who have nothing. And I'm not saying that those people don't exist, but I definitely had that, that dichotomy in my own home of two completely different backgrounds being together in this 
totally public benefit work where many, 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 many times, even now, don't get paid. And it would just irritate him mm -hmm. to no end. And I had to get my judgment off and kind of try to understand that. And it right. was foreign to me because I never did go to bed hungry. Right. Unless I was fasting, you right. know, and digitally. But never did go to bed hungry or cold. It's a totally different psychological me mechanism. And he would say, you know, Ginny, you know, how, how, can, how can someone think about the bigger picture? How can kids learn in a school when they're starving? No, they and it just humbled me. I mean, I owe so much to him through mm -hmm. that those life lessons of being with someone from a completely other place with other experiences and then and it humbled me and it it, it reinforced that I I have to give back definitely definitely that is one of the the main benefits that I could see this this rebirth of sensitivity that's occurred is like the for whatever reason the epigenetic wave of sensitivity that we got from the baby boomers affluence somehow, some way is trying, if it can, to bring back uh, the law, yeah. which the law to me is the law was originally intended to have balance with your environment. Yeah. Well, it's nature's universal law. Right. It's always seeking right. balance. You know, we balance isn't actually... Um, achieved, but for more than a second, right. because it's always seeking. It, it, it's always adding, subtracting nature. It doesn't just stay. Yeah. It's constantly adjusting. And Have you heard the term dynamic dis disequilibrium? No, but I like it. So it's a Taoist principle. Yeah. And it says the actual balance in nature and human is never 50-50. Yeah. It's like 6139. Right. Because this means it ensures that there's going to be a movement. Always. There's always movement. And life is defined by movement. So to have this movement brings me to this question. Because I always like to talk to people that are in the thick about this particular thing. Because I, I'm, it's probably because I, my self-image is, is in it a little bit is... The notion of invasive species. Ooh. So here you're planting all these trees. You're, in, in fact, you're a foreigner, comes mm -hmm. to foreign land, yet you are adding benefit to the community. You're doing these things. You're planting millions of trees. Mm -hmm. But you're not indigenous to here. No. So the question is actually a twofold question. <laughs> You as an invasive species, as a, as a human being, mm -hmm. and how you actually see that from a planting perspective. Is there such thing as an invasive species? Yes, there is a such thing as an invasive species, and yes, I am one, and I have integrated here, and I think of of all the wonderful experiences I've had as it's having my Costa Rican community family has made me happy here for 20 years, mm -hmm. even on a, on a, you know, a hard day. Right. Um, I don't feel invasive. I feel accepted and, and received, mm -hmm. but that's because I've put that work behind it. And I think a lot of foreigners come here and live in a bubble. And so, that may not be a shared experience in their world, but I've created for myself, and you use the word lucky, and my dad always says, Jenny, it's not luck. You did the work. Of course, luck comes to play in things, but um, you know, I've gotten out there and worked right alongside of people, so that's helped, and I do think that there are some species that come in that thrive, so to keep this metaphor going, to go from the human into the plant world, and what I've learned over time and sort of softened my ideas about the invasive species. So yes, they exist, and you can't deny it. You have to be careful, because too many destroys, like the kudzu. Mm -hmm. 
they brought the kudzu in to nitrogen fix. Right. Just like in Mississippi, in Louisiana. Mississippi, not so much Louisiana. I went to Ole Miss undergrad mm -hmm. writing school. And I would drive home and just marvel at the kudzu and how it was just eating the forests. And they brought that same thing into Costa Rica, into the African oil palms, to mm -hmm. nitrogen fix. Well, it's taking over. Mm -hmm. It's taking over. So it's, it's an invasive species that is wreaking havoc. Mm -hmm. Us gringos are wreaking havoc here. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is integrating. Right. Some people are absolutely capitalizing, buying a piece of cheap land, splitting it into a bunch of lots, making a bunch of money, calling it an eco-permaculture thing. Me and my friend call those the SSDs. What does that stand for? The slippery, super slippery, the slippery sustainable development. Right, yeah. Yeah, it's just flowery words. You know, and um, yeah, I guess I, I'll call it, I, I have a little, it's not for me to judge, mm -hmm. but I have a little struggle at times with this invasiveness that we do, and I've been taught some lessons by some Costa Ricans with regard to that. And um, so moving into the plant world, same thing. You know, I've always just been a complete champion of the native species. No invasive species. No foreign species. Let's produce and plant what is from here. Mm -hmm. And I get it. Yes, the coconuts floated over on the ocean, and they were originally from Indonesia. Mm -hmm. But they still got here naturally. Right. Or maybe a few things came on the boat with Christopher Columbus, whose name is actually Cristobal Colon, right? Mm -hmm. We changed his name to Christopher Columbus, which I think is hilarious. Mm -hmm. um, so I've softened my X on the invasive non-native species and recognized that they're kind of everywhere. But I still see the same thing, which is a lot of these species that people bring in from Thailand and Indonesia and such, they don't really produce. Mm -hmm. They produce over there, but they don't really produce here. So you fill your farm up with a bunch of trees that actually aren't giving fruit. Right. Whereas we can't afford to do that with our Costa Rican partners. We need to put things on their farm that they can actually produce from, that they can eat, that they can sell, that's actually going to grow. Mm -hmm. So I go a lot of places and see a lot of projects and, and go, oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's a neat tree. It's from Indonesia. I get it. It's a macadamia. Has it given you fruit? Well, no. Oh, okay. What about this one? Has it given you fruit? Well, well no. Oh, what about that one? Has it given you fruit? Well, no. So I prefer to stick with the native species, accepting that, that the, the weird species like the durians. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. You know, we did produce some durians this year. Someone gave us the seeds. Great. Yes, the jackfruit. Yes, mm -hmm. wonderful food. You know, we are the, the new pirates and people sailing around the world with our little bag of seeds mm -hmm. trying to figure out what gives and what doesn't give and how do we integrate as humans mm -hmm. foreign people in foreign lands and as the plants we bring in so i like the kale at the farmer's market <laughs> but i mean it, ha it has to be babied it doesn't grow easily like a cabbage does right. There's all those considerations there. So I don't have a bright line anymore, mm -hmm. but I'm careful. So what do you think? I have a, I have a company here. This podcast is actually named after. It's, uh, I, I make biochar. Right. I, I fix carbon because the soil here doesn't really hold that much carbon. Right. As, as you get closer to the equator, the majority of the mineral content uh, that the trees got here originally was through the air, through the water vapor. And so our notion as North Americans of, you know, it all comes from the soil, in a way, the soil does do that, but in tropical settings, you know, a lot of what's occurring is occurring through the rain and the water vapor that we're exposed to. 
So but what I found to have some of these weird species, these invasive species grow on, on my farm was I had to fix carbon, mm -hmm. a lot of it, and put it in the ground mm -hmm. because my farm is red clay. Yeah. It was an old pasture land that yeah. then became a, a coffee plantation, totally abused, and uh, I got it for that reason. To, yeah. To, this was a coffee farm too. That's why my house is here. I didn't cut anything to build it. It yeah. was it was a coffee farm, a dead one at that. Yeah. So because the soils are thin and all the biomass, right, that would give the the soil these nutrients and carbon, which comes from the trees, right, has long been washed away. Right. So what I found is, on my farm, just doing compost piles and all that was like the the death of me. I hated it. So much work. So much work for so little return. Yeah. And uh, do you know Itai? Um, Itai, he's, I forget what company he works for. He's, he's called me a few times. I don't think I've ever met him. In fact, uncannily, like two or three days ago, someone connected us and said, here's Jenny. So I, he calls me sometimes and like picks my brain, but... Yeah. Haven't met him. He's a brilliant permaculturist. Everything mm -hmm. he's ever turned me on to works. Cool. And he turned me on to biochar. He goes, look, look into Terra Preta. Yeah. And when I started to examine the, the Amazonian biochar mm -hmm. scene and how, what was actually in the Amazon relative to what we were told and all that stuff, or at least what I had known. Blew my mind. And I was like, oh, I never have to deal with a, with a compost pile again. And so I started making biochar, and all my trees where I use the biochar are significantly healthier. A lot less pest invasion. Like, you yeah. can just tell the little mycelium are doing their thing. And so I know your, your company is into... A, to carbon fixation and sequestration and all that type of stuff. Where do you see the biochar technology and all that? Do you see that as applicable to to what you're doing or anything that makes the trees healthier and more resistant is always applicable. So absolutely, mm -hmm. and um, I love biochar. Mm -hmm. For us, when we are talking about our carbon fixation, we're actually fixing the carbon long-term in the trees right. and the soil. Right. So the very first measurement of soil for carbon sequestration was done here on a farm in Costa Rica. Oh, wonderful. So I became, yeah, I became a certified carbon auditor at Earth University two years ago. Oh, great. It's constantly going back to school and because I love school. And... Uh, did a semester, it was incredibly interesting, and learned how to measure the carbon in the soil. So part of what you said is true and part is not. Oh, do tell. Which is to say that once you get the trees going, and if they're planted in a very good, diverse forest matrix using biomimicry, copying the forest, letting the secondary come back, they will begin to sequester carbon back into the soil mm -hmm. and we regenerate our soils where the soils are what they used to be before the rainforest was cut down. This place wasn't always dead red clay. Mm -hmm. It's that we cut the rainforest down in the mm -hmm. torrential rains and the sun washed the very thin layer of mm -hmm. topsoil away. But when you get the trees really dropping good biomass, mm -hmm. they begin to carbon sequester sequester into the soil almost more than the tree itself Wonderful. and it is really impressive just how much carbon is sequestered in the roots alone mm -hmm. and so when trees are dropping their branches that's carbon returning back into the soil and, and it's in a farm of real sea mm -hmm. so when we do our carbon sequestration calculations there's a co2 aspect that we measure the tree, so how big, how fast mm -hmm. does it grow. That's why we do more carbon sequestration in trees in the equator zones because they grow bigger, faster, 365-day growing season. Mm -hmm. 
there's your carbon in the tree. But we also have the measurements for what is going into the dirt. And that is measured in terms of actual C, carbon. Not carbon dioxide, but right. C. And different trees, depending on how much biomass they're dropping, including the fruits, have mm -hmm. different levels of sequestration there. And one of the biggest carbon sequesters is the guava tree. The mm, big baya yeah. inga, the big yeah. ice cream fruit. That's like one of the number ones for the dirt, for the soil. Wonderful. Because it drops so much branches it and there's does. big fruits and the leaves and it's just a constant. So once you get, again, that mycelial carpet growing, which is related to the center of our motor, which is the tree, mm -hmm. then you can do amazing numbers of carbon back into the soil and it's really us taking the pollution out of the air the co2 and introducing it back into the soil from where it came mm -hmm. and i love biochar and it has a place to go mm -hmm. and and it, and it is a fabulous tool mm -hmm. but we are focused on actual regeneration of the soils and putting the carbon in back that way and I've had some people come in and go oh Jenny your community could do this and I'm like well yeah but I mean the 25 bucks per tree and all the labor they're already doing there's just no extra to pay them to start making biochar but we do welcome seminars and mm -hmm. capacitations and some of them do it just because they know already they're, they're earth people. Mm -hmm. that, that's why they slashed and burned, was right. to release the nutrients through the burning and bring the alkalinity of the soil mm -hmm. up and the acidity down and put the potash and the potassium back in. But, um, you know, we can't spend a bunch of time burying in biochar with the trees. It's so much work that they have to do as it is. Right with the 25 bucks and I'm careful not to ask them to do a lot of extra things. Right. It's a sensitivity. That it's that sensitivity, but I love it. Right. And again, love to offer those kinds of capacitations and teach it and then let people do what they will. Well, here's the permaculture side of it. Cause I'm always trying to stack functions. Yes. My biochar reactors, I cook on. Yeah. So I have tons of, of, leaf litter and coughing and and I always have wood. And we it, all do. And it's yes. a local resource. It's renewable. It's renewable. I can burn it smokelessly mm -hmm. at the same time make biochar and at the same time cook. Awesome. And heat water. So to me I'm like stacking three very big functions that like really get a lot of work done. And at the same time, my little garden, not necessarily planting big trees that are going to be out, but just my, my garden per se, my under roof garden, things like that, the, the yields that I'm seeing are pretty, pretty remarkable. Oh, I, I know it to be true with my own eyes and, and you were just on my little yes. piece of land and saw those chunks of burned wood there and yes. those are being saved to be dug into the new garden space. So Full I, on connect. I had a total alchemical moment with your explanation of carbon. Carbon is a six six sided molecule. Yes, it's it's represented by the hexagon and Saturn. So carbon sequestration is really Saturnian sequestration. It's putting Saturn, which is the from the alchemical perspective, is Chronos, is time. It's putting time back into the ground. Yeah, man, I love that. And that's why we are so committed to the long-term maintenance of the trees. Right. These trees have to go, grow robust for at least 20 to 25 years to pull in the one ton of carbon that we say per tree which is proven and very conservative, not counting any of the carbon we're putting back into the soil, right. which actually at a certain point far exceeds once the tree reaches about 20 to 25 years. It's no longer in its adolescent pack-it-on stage. It's mm -hmm. growing a little more slowly. It's also getting harder, which right. means more carbon. Right. But um, time is the critical point Mm -hmm. And tree growing. I mean, again, Definitely. if you're just going to plant the tree, 
it's not doing anything if it doesn't really grow and prosper. And right. so time, your Saturnian return of time, it's the missing point we yeah. really hadn't covered here. And, and I love that it went full circle like that because it is. And I liken growing trees to uh, growing children. Right. You know, you look at the first, biologically, they say that a child needs care for its first four years. But at around four to four and a half, any human can fend for themselves if it has to. Mm -hmm. That human could survive. Before four, not really. It is exactly the same thing with a tree. Wow. Yeah. We see them around four, four and a half years. If we can get to them to that place with some really good management, some real good pruning of that lower branch stuff, some opening of some of the secondary crowding that may have sprouted up around it. Right. It will sprout up because we've brought the temperatures down on the soil, mm -hmm. which enables it to absorb more water, mm -hmm. fix that broken hydrological cycle, and introduce the carbon back into the soil. So when we reach four, four and a half years, if we've got them all set up, they're off and running, and we don't have a whole lot of work to do anymore. That's wonderful. That's such a beautiful, I, I, that's just such a beautiful way for us to end this interview. Yeah, because thanks. The work that you're doing, the beautification that's occurring, and when I say beautification, I'm not just talking about from a you know vanity perspective, but beautification as in making things better, you know, the the fire element in you that's out there, you know, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? <laughs> is really to be praised, and I thank and you. I do praise it from across the valley and today. So thank you so much. Thank Where can people find out about what you're doing? And we are community. CarbonTrees.org. .org. And I am Tree Jenny mm -hmm. on Instagram. Uh, we have a super informative Facebook community, Carbon Trees, and a YouTube channel. Beautiful. And we welcome people to come visit, come give us your gifts, come get involved, become a tree ambassador, be a tree salesman, make a little money. Excellent. It's all about that symbiosis. Mm -hmm. um, share us. Mm -hmm. Send us your love and energy. <laughs> yes, definitely. Well, I'll put links to everything in the, Thank in you. the show notes and make sure to try and drive some traffic your way. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure and such a connection yes. and, and just what a joy. It's Wonderful. great to be collaborating. Yes. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Big thanks to Jenny Smith of Community Carbon Trees. She is just a ball of fire, everyone. Uh, please do check out her website and her Facebook page for they're doing such wonderful things. And you talk about people that are actually making a difference. You know, they're they're putting their ethics right in front of them and taking one step at a time to make this place better i mean can you imagine a million trees and <laughs> if you've ever dug a ditch in red clay in the tropics you know it's not the easiest thing so you know please put your hands together for jenny and uh if you can send some money her way because that just means that we all get more oxygen in the future our upcoming interviews are get a little bit saucy. I have uh, Max Egan, the incomparable Max Egan, coming up. I also have Tracy Twyman again. We're going to get into some serious uh, technocratic discussions about, uh, well, between both of them, we're actually getting into the technologies of spelling. Uh, using words, what all this spell binding type of things have done, and with Max specifically, we're going to get into the 5G technologies, the millimeter wave technologies, and how that could affect us. And I'm also did a interview with Mike Williams that we'll both be posting at the same time. Um, we're <laughs> we jump into the consciousness aspect of things. Um, here at BioCharisma, I am going to be shifting gears and I'm going to be starting a new podcast called Sovereignty Tech. 
because I want to focus on those technologies that can actually be a benefit that we can put in 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 action. Um, all these technologies that I'll be discussing are things that if you have a little ingenuity uh, you can just jump right into. There's nothing out there too far-fetched in the future and as Nassim Tlaib would say they are anti-fragile technologies. These are things that uh, will stand the test of time even if time seems to be a little bit chaotic. So thank you for joining us again. I will be uh, starting to post my podcast on YouTube uh, as per Max Egan's suggestion. And uh, yeah, we're going to be changing the format of everything. We have a, a lot of good things coming down the pipeline. So thank you for your support. Uh, you can donate at biocharisma.com and look forward to hearing any comments and feedback. And we'll see you next week.